to another First Minister's Questions discussion with Stuart Lockhead and Norrie Stewart. Well, Norrie, um, a little, I think it was a little disappointing compared to last week. It was boring as sin and a kind of Ian Gray has obviously decided that the only chink in the armour is these care homes. Asking basically the same question again <laughs> with the rider that there's going to be two to three hundred job losses in Scotland with Southern Cross. Getting the same answer except that Nicola Sturgeon is taking personal responsibility to ensure that the care is continued should anything go wrong. Same question, same answer, same well, look, lack Ian, of Yeah, all right. Well, Ian Gray quite clearly thought he had something to go on, on the basis that uh, 50 jobs were being lost from the care home regulator, which I believe is called Skizwiz. Skizwiz, yes. We'll yes. try it. Uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore the regulation won't be so good. And these 50 jobs are to go over this current year. Alex Salmon said straight away, more or less, that um, those 50 jobs are going over three years. And I forget, he made some other. He did actually answer the quite that point. Yeah, but he said that it was an amalgamation of, I think, three Well, that's right. That the Skizbiz was an amalgamation of three different regulatory bodies. And therefore there was a certain amount of efficiency and the jobs were going over three years. And I think that was a, actually quite a good answer. But it certainly was. Um, but before, before we get into the, the, the meat of, the, of this week's FMQs, I think we have to, I have to say it's quite clearly the criticism of the domination of last week's First Minister questions by Mr. Sams and very long answer to Ian Gray, Animal Goldie and Willie Rennie to the, took it on the chin. Ian, uh, Ian Gray's contribution was over in seven minutes, whereas last week the three of them all together, opposition leaders, took up 25 minutes. Animal Goldie was about two or three minutes, and Willie Rennie didn't get a shout this week, apparently. He only gets a shout one week in three. That's what you get for doing so badly in the polls. I did notice on the, the tweets that somebody had mentioned that you were... If you were a Liberal Democrat, you were only allowed one tweet to everybody else's three. <laughs> that was a reference to the fact yes. that well, the leader of the Lib Dems in <coughs> Hollywood only gets to ask a question formally one week in three. Um, there was more constituency questions. Um, I'm not, it was, I'm sorry, it was boring. It was boring. It was there was boring. no fire in it at all. Which is going to be a problem because... They're obviously much better briefed. The SNP are much better briefed. They do have answers. You know, um, they're going to have more personnel on the ground. They're going to be able to make a better job of what was a very good job in the last parliament. Well, they, and on top of that, you know, they've, they've had four years of experience. They pulled a team together and ran one of the most um, impressive election campaigns you and I have ever experienced, apparently. Well, I mean, By all accounts, it was fantastic. very professional. I think, I mean, Ian Gray's stance on the, on the care homes, if something goes wrong, what he's done is laid the groundwork. I agree with you. I think that is what he's done. But I can't see the SNP, well, Nicholas Sturgeon is a canny lassie. I can see that she doesn't have the plans she needs in place. Right. She wouldn't have taken personal responsibility if so she didn't have something. If it goes devastatingly sleep. wrong, it's uh, it's a serious banana skin that they should have had well shoveled out of the way. I think um, it's worth saying about about the whole FMQs. Um, the question of respect to the presiding officer and her taking control of something didn't happen. In fact, throughout today's FMQs, he kept interrupting her. There would be a question to the First Minister. She would then say, First Minister, he was, he, someone was answering before she had even said it. But and she, he, he, he did it all the way through. I'm sorry, but they were all, I mean, I did notice, I can't remember the guy's name, the guy whose daughter's in Parliament as well. Now, McMahon. Michael McMahon. Aye, he, he, he was standing up looking at her, waiting for his name to be called. 
So it might actually just be a question of timing on her part. It came across that, it certainly came across that Simon was... He'll be a different presiding officer. Presumably, there is no need for uh, the presiding officer to constantly say First Minister. That's protocol, isn't it? Um, anyway, that, was, uh, that, uh, that occurred to me. Um, I think, I suppose, the funniest bit, as usual, was when Adam McGoldy uh, stood up. Um, Simon's joke was well prepared, mm. and it was a reference to the, the two referendums yeah. Yeah. row this week. And uh, he did, because the Annabel Goldie's normal question is, when uh, are you going to meet the, mm. the Scottish Secretary, Secretary of State for Scotland? And uh, Simon said, well, I met him yesterday and I'm going to meet him again today, and I've now embarked on a two-meeting strategy. <laughs> so that if I don't get the right answer from the first meeting, I'll get the right answer from the second one. So that went down quite well. It will be interesting to see. I mean, I think, I think the Unionist coalition has given up on the borrowing powers. I think we're going to get that. We're going to get it sooner rather than later. But I can see nothing else being given away. At the moment, that is the position. But I don't <coughs> think, um, as I said, don't think, well, this particular podcast, I don't think this is a forum to discuss the, the broader strategy. I have been reading some very interesting articles, some long ones by some very deeply well thought out ones. And uh, we can come to that. Uh, even, even Mr. John McTernan, mm. who, as a former advisor, was it Tony Blair he was advising? I think so, yes. At uh, number 10, uh, absolute staunch Labour Blairite. Uh, he was this, the main spoiler on behalf of the Labour Party at the recent election, and there's some of the garbage he came out with. However, it was very interesting. We'll cover that later. Can I just come back to see Annabel Goldie um, when Alec came back with his two meeting strategy? Um, Annabel Goldie, of course, came back with. She must must have been expecting that anyway. She she said, "Well, it takes two to tango," <laughs> and I hope you uh, both. Something she muttered something about mutual pleasure, which I thought was hmm, <laughs> getting a bit close. <laughs> Notice Ray's ticket gone this week. Had it? Maybe he, he forgot to pick the ointment on or something. <laughs> or something takes a pill. Uh, what was interesting, of course, I mean, there were little things. Um, was it Alec Ferguson, the, 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 the former presiding officer? Yeah, yeah. You know, was it, his question on um, Glasgow University. Yeah, it? well, Glasgow University has a devolved role at the Crichton campus in Dumfries. Yeah. Now Dumfries is a long way away from everywhere else and uh, knowing what the Harriet Watt situation is in Gala Shields as regards to because they came in and take over the Scottish College of Textiles and they know the importance to the, the borders and they're a lot closer to central health than that Dumfries. I am aware in the back of my mind of a history about this Crichton, Crichton campus and the, the importance to Dumfries so was both interesting to see Alec Ferguson as a constituency MSP, a man whose voice we've heard plenty in four years of his presiding officer, and the issue itself, which he he took advantage of his experience as a presiding officer and came out with a, a mini speech. Yes, he did. It wasn't it wasn't so much a question as a statement. Yes, and then he got the response he wanted. He knew he would get the response he wanted, and uh, uh, Alec Salmon. Um, must have been expecting something similar, uh, because uh, he managed to get David, David Mundell previously. This was it's an ongoing issue. It's I, th I think a lot of a lot of these things being flagged up by the universities purely and simply as leverage. Well, it is. You know, um, don't forget you're dealing with clever people at universities. But they're they're never going to get popular backing for it. I mean, what, what's it, the kind of cuts they've got in mind? Well. They're because they want more funding, but and they, but they want the cuts that they're and the cuts they're announcing are the they can be described as um, courses that are regu regarded as unnecessary for the for, for work, yes. sociology, philosophy, yes. the humanities, yes. 
Uh, they're not. It's easy to attack them from a Daily Mail perspective, a Daily Telegraph perspective. So this is why they're cutting them. And, uh, Which means we avoid the fun debate they're going to have in England about the government not being able to pay for the loans for the poor students to go to university. Oh, aye, this is something. Okay, so yes. They ain't got enough money. Yeah, yeah because of the right, because of all nearly all the universities are going to charge the maximum nine thousand. The uh, right of student loans that the government's going to come up with wasn't budgeted for. Yeah, well, that's an interesting one. I love these things that people didn't expect. Yes, but that, I mean, that's the other strength of what? I mean, it's a cross-parliamentary agreement in reality. It's only the Tories, isn't it, really, that are looking for a huge hike. Well, a huge hike. They're looking at the Liberals to a certain extent. But I rather feel that in Scotland the Liberals would rather see free education they're simply towing the party line. But then, you know what your budget is. You can dictate the budget. You'll always get complaints from the university, but it's it's actually a more powerful position. Well, a more powerful is the wrong word. It's an easily easier managed position. Whereas the government, the UK government has said, right, you know, we've calculated that X number of universities are going to be second or third division and only charge five, six, seven thousand. Well, nobody is going to consider themselves second or third division. It was entirely foreseeable. So they would, most of them would charge the maximum. Hmm. Well, you're going to charge the maximum to try and get into the first division. Yeah, well, it's perception, no isn't it? Reason. Exactly. So well, why look, they're surprised beyond me. Coming back to um, First Minister's questions, we had another predictable topic. Sandra White brought it up which of course was yesterday's announcement by Trinity Mirror, the owners of the Daily Mirror group down south, the Daily Record, Sunday Mail in Scotland. And uh, we always get that at FMQs, if there's any jobs, and that job losses announced, the constituency, MSP, always gets to the opportunity, to, the opportunity yeah. to raise it at FMQs. Of course this week, this was a, a red hot one, this one, because uh, it's, it's 90 out of 100, it's half. Half the jobs, half the journalists have been made, made redundant at the Daily Record and Sunday Mail. Uh, but of course, the other side of the coin is the Daily Record and the Sunday Mail have been so anti the SNP yeah. and their entire, as long as I can remember. And uh, it was interesting that Alex Salmond did manage to get a dig in at them when he answered the question about, yes, we will, of course we will try and help retain the jobs and, and, and of any influence we can to make sure they don't go. But he did point out that they hadn't always been very kind to the SNP. But again, I mean, he, he used that quite well because he came out doing the we're the government for all the people, even the people that hate us. Ah. You know, so once again, uh, Mr. Salmond managed to keep the ball in the air quite nicely. I think the other, the interesting character that I'd never heard of before was Neil Finlay. I I spotted him as well. He was a Rottweiler. He was wanting his attention. Yeah. I, I went to the trouble of uh, Googling him. There's not a lot around about him. I think he was probably one of these people on the Labour list that was never expected to be yeah, an yeah. MSP. It's only because they did so badly on the constituency that he's there. He's a councillor in West Lothian. Councillor for Faldhouse and the Brich Valley. Faldhouse? Faldhouse. Now, even in West Lothian, Faldhouse is regarded as... Let's not be too Mine, polite. Mining territory. Yes, um, there is a there is a, a scale of good and bad mining towns in West Lothian, and Faldus is well down the bottom. I would not have in any way guessed that he had anything to do with Faldus. I mean, he's got all his teeth. <laughs> and the Brief Valley. You're, you're laughing. Yeah. The only three guys I know for Faldus have made front teeth. <laughs> Well, I do remember he I had cause 20 years ago to spend a fair bit of time in Faldhouse, but I did a lot of business there. Interesting place, Faldhouse, shots. But it was an interesting question for an, an MSP. About the corporation tax, wasn't it? I mean, it's hardly what you would expect out of a Faldhouse Labour MSP. <laughs> he was, uh, he, he came out with, he'd done his research, and he claimed, uh, he was referring back to him, um, Alex Salmon, a long, long time ago, when he was banned from the House of Commons as an MP for uh, 
What did he actually cr he criticised? He stood up. Uh, I can't remember the actual words. I remember him being ba banned. It was banned, but it was Parliament, actually he, he. Neil Finlay tried to make out that the the outburst was about corporation tax. tax. It was in fact about a cut in higher rate income tax and income tax. the coal tax apparently yeah. that, that he'd. Uh, yeah, I actually remember that. And so I, I kind of messed that up. So. I will go back and look at that myself and possibly uh, post something about it online because I wanted to review it and to get the the detail because there's a bit more meat in there to come. But it, it was, I think, it, it, what struck me was that this guy was so aggressive and we've never been before. Well, I mean, thank God. To yeah, be quite it makes it more interesting. Because um, it is looking very conciliatory. No, I, <laughs> you know, for all the promises of we we will scrutinise the government, nobody, it's early days, but nobody seems to be that venomous about the scrutiny. Um, we, then we had a planted question from John Mason, uh, SMP, MSP from Glasgow, um, praising Jim McGall, who's uh, a Glasgow industrialist, who seems to think uh, one of these... He's not, not only he's an SNP fan, but he's in favour of uh, Scotland having control of corporation tax. This, this is the one who... Clyde Blowers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and John Bors. Mason got, got it slightly wrong, didn't he? Clyde Bowers. I was uh, waiting for a, a really spoonerism, you know. I was, the oh dear. The jumped into my mind of a you know, very, I think very slow meeting he had with a guy. Careful what you say here, you might regret it. And Ali Salmon was... Obviously, he knew that question was coming, and he said he agreed with um, with Wendy Alexander and Jack Connell, mm. intellectual heavyweights, or the or, or something like that, of the Labour Party. And Aye, smart people, yeah, smart, people. intelligent people. I can't quite remember the context. He, he does that on a regular basis. That he pulls in support from previous members, uh, Opposition. other party members yeah. who are previous who said things that he's now. Yes, they're now. Um, yeah. um, and then Hamza Yusuf, who's another SM. Of course, we're going to have loads of SM questions from well, SMP members. There's loads of them there. I, I kind of think he's going to come to the fore. I think he's a bit of a star right enough. I think he definitely is a rising star. But, but again, that was a bit of a plan. Well, it gave up Alex Salmon a chance to talk about the money that their, um, the government is. is planning to spend on carers. We're back on care, carers. And this time it was, the, 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 the was specifically about individual carers and how £5 million had been found um, as, so that carers could get respite. respite. Yeah. And then talked about £3 million extra care funding over the next four years. 20% of that would go to carers. 300 Three hundred million yes, yeah, over yeah. four years for the whole care sector, but what exactly was I don't know. I mean, I think the point what the point of the returning to the topic and focusing on individual carers rather than the care sector and Southern yeah. Cross was that we it must we must be approaching National Carers Week, and that was. Um, and then, well, the other question from the Labour guy whose name escapes me about. Um, carers as well, where he pointed out that many of them don't have a contingency plan should they fall ill. Yes, that, now that, that, you, that really followed on from this morning's debate, which I well, caught I, a bit of. I thought that was quite interesting, because that was one of those kind of things where here's a practical, you can help facilitate a practical solution, and that's how Alex Hammond picked it up and took it forward, which was almost a highlight for me because it wasn't playing the sort of the game it was saying you know problem we need a solution you know he, he kind of said i'll personally he kind of said well i'll he will check personally yeah. the, the, the the labor msp was dr richard simpson who usually comes across as fairly intelligent and reasonable now you occasionally see him on the discussion programs yeah. he's um, the only time i've really he's annoyed me uh, in recent months has been his uh, when the, the Labour Party were being so negative about m alcohol minimum pricing he kind of led that I forget what it's unusual for a doctor I know, I know. a doctor obviously a medical mm. doctor 
But he, he, what he said was that um, respite care, um, yes, he was talking about respite care, sorry, but he was, you were, right, he was talking about, you're right, that he'd been to a meeting of carers and they'd asked, they'd asked all the carers in the audience how many of them had plans, contingency plans, if things go, went, go wrong, if they, you know, and only 5% had. And that was really what he wanted, this is what Alex Salmon said, well, he was going to, yes, this seemed to be a new problem, and yes, he would personally see that, what could be, do about, be done about it. That, that, to me, is much more, is the advantage of the smaller unit that's Hollywood. Ah. That a problem like that can be brought up, and, you know, a job can be done informing carers, making the path easy for them to find out the information they need about the help they can get should anything go wrong. And to me, that's why things should come down to a smaller scale. Much more difficult to deal with as yes. a British problem. Yeah. Far easier to deal with in Scotland as a Scottish problem. Yeah, and the, it was interesting that yesterday Scottish Power announced an enormous mm -hmm. increase in their charges. Is it 19% increase for their gas? 10% increase for their electricity. I, I, I'm talking as if it's got nothing to do with me. It actually really makes a huge difference to me because yeah. it's yeah. going to mean uh, uh, well, I'm suddenly poorer for the next year, quite considerably. But he managed to bring that in. It was interesting. There were two, top, two aspects to that that Alex Salmon mentioned. An energy assistance package. Apparently there is such a thing. And as a pensioner, I may be... I may qualify for assistance there, so I'll need to check that out. Um, but the 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 line was here, this is where Alex Salmon came up with thumping fuel bills. That was a classic Alex Salmon. Oh, he described oh, them as thumping fuel bills. Now I can imagine that'll be in the papers tomorrow. It's it's well past out something was done about that. But again, devolved to the UK. And where's the money? Parliament, isn't it? Uh, for support of nuclear energy, I saw somewhere. What, the money? The money. It's by infrastructure and what is? The, the rise. Oh, I see. Yeah, Part right. of it, I, I understand, is to do with the yeah. renewal of infrastructure. So, of course, what will happen is the Scottish grid, which costs a fortune to join, uh, will, of course, be equalised with what it costs in other parts of the country to add yourself into the grid. Oh, I see. Okay, I know what you mean. Right, so we, but then we had, I think, I'm not sure... That was sarcasm, in case you missed it. <laughs> um, we had Michael McMahon, which you uh, know there's... He, his, his daughter is also MMSP, the father-daughter couple. Um, I'm not sure what what his constituency is, but hers, she lost out at Adrian Schott's on the constituency vote and had to come in as a list MSP. Anyway, Mr McMahon, he did brought up um, the question of the council tax freeze and he had tried to have a go at the, 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 the Labour Party been on at this for ages, kind of saying that uh, the council tax freeze for the next five years is not fully funded, but you know the the, the amount of income that the yeah. councils will yeah. uh, will not receive as a result of the freeze is not fully funded by by the Scottish government. And um, <laughs> he mentioned that a Gaudi. Oh yes, he moved on to the Gaudi report. Now we're getting into a difficulty here. Now this is an Alex Salmon's super injunction. Now there is. Uh, Ali Salmond has been refusing to give information to the Freedom of Information of Commissioner um, about the, gen the, the costs of the SNP's local income tax plans. And uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 I'll need to, I'll need to re revisit this and to, to get the detail, but we're in, in an area where the suggestion was that Alex Salmond has something to hide. I would imagine it's the fact that it's not actually going to make many people better off. <laughs> I mean, it, it's almost certain that a local income tax will hit the, the thinking masses much harder than anybody else. Well, this was an, but this was an area where I was... Salmon's answer to this accusation that he's hiding 
the, the real costs of, uh, if, if they come up with local income tax instead of uh, a council tax. Uh, he said that the, the facts were published in the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you're going, well, you can't have said that unless it's true. Well, I missed it. <laughs> I missed it as well. And again, um, the, the suggestion was, I think Gavin Brown now, he, Gavin Brown, if you recall, I used to interview Gavin Brown regularly on Leith FM. And uh, Gavin is a clever man mm. and a rising star. And I've got a funny feeling he's a potential replacement for Animal Goldie. I've seen him mention. He managed to, he carried on with the question about funding council tax freeze and asked if it, inflation had been taken into account. Salmoned again. Master stroke. What? I mean, that really surprised me. Because that's bad research. I mean, the answer for Alex Salmon to come out and say, yes, our contingency is 3%, hmm. everybody else's... Down south of the border, it's only 25 2.5%. 25 and the Labour Party based their figures on 1.5%. <laughs> I mean, that's statistics. In the simplest, purest form, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's a closet SNP hiding in the Tory party. But, I mean, that was giving points away. Uh, well, well, Gavin Brown, I think Gavin Brown just wanted to be noticed. Because mm. it's, you know, his, his hat's in the ring to be the, the, the Tory leader. And uh, as long as he doesn't make any big poo-poos, he's clever enough. He might, be, he might get, the, get the job. There's plenty of time. And then, towards the end, we're getting towards the end now, we got into the one that I've actually been very, the topic that I've been very interested in this week. And I've been firing little uh, direct messages and Facebook things to SNP people. And this is the question of defence in an independent Scotland. And what are the contingency plans? For example, you've got Richard Lockhead, um, who's a minister, an SNP minister, but his um, constituency is Murray. Two RAF bases, Kinloss and Lossiemouth, huge part of the local economy. Kinloss already virtually closed their mission. <coughs> They've had their passing out parades, they're just running it down at Forest. Only 10 miles away, Lossiemouth, major base, major employer. That's looking it what could survive. On top of Fox admitting this week in front of a Westminster Select Committee that Scotland had borne. A disproportionate of the cut. But this is, yeah, I get that, but you see, the, the issue is this. Where does the SNP stand in an, for an independent armed forces in an independent Scotland? On the, right now, all we're getting, we, the, the policy is something to defend jobs. Well, we do. I want, we, we want to. what we do, did historically. We become mercenaries. Okay, but the, right now, <laughs> the SNP policy is to, do, we want all the bases, except Fuzzling, <laughs> we'll come to that. We want it's lost can lost, but they want to keep lost them out, they want to keep lookers, they want to keep the contracts to build the ships, they want to keep Rosyth. They don't want to, they don't want Faz Lane because it's nuclear. But really the, the question it's a big elephant in the room. Nobody's saying what happens well, when we get independent. No You do, you become England's aircraft carrier. As England is America's aircraft carrier. I mean, strategically, the argument, you remember the arguments years ago about basing these things in Scotland, because strategically that was the best place to put them. Now, strategically, it isn't the best place to put them. What happened to world geography that it suddenly changed? Look, the reason that the, the, the American, do you remember the Americans were in the Holy Loch, only yeah. five miles away as the crow flies from, from, from the Gay Loch, Faz Lane. You know, we were talking. Uh, no, the the Americans were there with a floating base uh, before Fans Lane was established. Now, I've never understood the, whether there was a connection between the two. I think it was well, it but was certainly the, the connected. Certainly, as far as the, the powers that be in London were concerned, as long as they were a long way away from London, so that any uh, incoming ICBMs, because you know, you'd free enter from Russia, it would take out our nukes first. Well, the the, the other. I mean, the argument as part of the UK is that you shouldn't have all your eggs in one basket. Well, so they're all in one place. They're well, in Coolport. Well, that's what I'm saying. Lane. So, strategically, 
that's bad. You, it should be spread. Economically, you should have all your eggs in one basket, you know. So it's the balance of that. And, I mean, perfectly honestly, let's just suppose that they're sitting around the cabinet table discussing defence. Do you think they haven't said, what happens if Scotland goes independent? Oh, they've got a contingency plan. And all our nuclear stuff is at Faz Lane. Well, and, yeah. and all our fast strike aircraft are in Scotland. Yeah. Whoa, what well, do we do then? I would say the... the are, they, are they moving the furniture out of the old flat? At the moment, it's, there's no easy answer to Faz Lane because that was an enormous uh, construction project. And you've got to build, you've got to have, most of your uh, stuff's got to be underground, and hardened, stores. You know, it's not, you know, they can't easily move Faz Lane. Well, in, I mean, that, that's my point. I, I, I actually don't see it as a problem. I mean, the fighting the wars is a problem. You know, the, the actual bodies on the ground is a problem. Would a Scottish army go into Afghanistan? were we an independent country. But, you know, America has bases all over the world. So the has UK, Canada. The UK have bases yeah. all over the world. Yeah. Oh, that's true. You know, what, what, why would we not, why would the English not have a base in Scotland? We might not want them to be based in Scotland, but there really isn't any reason that it should be different at the time, it, well, it, it, it would it appear, would anyway, it. in practical terms, it, it, um, it, the audience, <coughs> it looks as though Lossiemouth is going to be saved. Looker is going to lose it. The, the RAF are going to move out of Lookers, but they're finally bringing the British Army of the Rhine back, and they've got to go somewhere. And uh, it looks as though that Lookers will become a major army base. That's the, that's what's been implied. Well, let's lighten up. Just a bit, but staying on the same subject. Um, David oh, McClatchy sorry, appeared. Wait, wait a minute. When was the last time you were in Lucas? Uh, oh yeah, um, about a month ago. Do you know, I would be a very unhappy soldier if I came back from Germany and they dumped me in Lucas. <laughs> Come on, you're only 10 miles in, from Dundee. Well, yeah, but you still have to get on a train or a bus to get there. Yeah, but that's kind of... I what mean, that Nathy will be the, the most profitable building in the whole of Scotland. Yeah, but they, that's where they're planning to put them. Oh, well. um, they've got, okay, I mean, they've got a secure perimeter. They just presumably build some more accommodation, and that's and and, and knock down the hangars. But yes, yeah, staying on the defence, David McCletchy, a form a former leader of the Tories, if you recall, once oh, upon a time, yeah. tax saver McCletchy, I think, was his yes, problem. Yeah. Um, he stood up and uh, asked the question about the was it the Scottish Royal Air Force which I had never heard, that's an expression I had actually never heard before. And, uh, you know, how big would it be, I think? What did, I, what did uh, Alex Salmon said? Something about Norway had seven air bases. Denmark has three air bases. Right now, Scotland's only got two, so he was suggesting that... Uh, it might expand. Yes, two air bases would be better than one. It's... It must be so frustrating uh, to, to find a chink in the arm. Mm. I mean, it, it, we're, we seem to be losing so much. If you think traditionally, I mean, in a lot of ways, Scotland has produced the cannon fodder for the British Army for a very long time. That's, you know, not to be unfair to the Irish and the Welsh, who have also played that role. I don't... I mean, the defence thing is, is it's a crock of shit. You know, I mean, we'll be an ally of, we'll be an ally of Ireland, Southern Ireland, just as it exists now. We might not want to go and fight in Libya, say, fine, don't. Do what the Dutch do, do what the Germans do, do what the French do, pick your battles. Send in humanitarian, humanitarian aid. Mm, just do it that way. I mean, that the soldiers nowadays probably do as much fetching and carrying water for the local populace as they do shooting them, <laughs> which is a good thing. Very good. Well, thank you very much.